I will tell you, it matters who you use as a real estate agent. Okay. But it's one of those deals that when you're going to a multiple offer situation, you don't want to be bringing a golden retriever. You want to be bringing a bulldog. Mm -hmm. It matters. Have you made an offer on a piece of real estate in the last few months here and not gotten your offer accepted? Have you tried to either buy a single family home, duplex, triplex, or fourplex, and come to find out that in this crazy, ridiculous time we live in with the global pandemic, for whatever reason, prices are skyrocketing through the roof and you are finding yourself unable to compete with all cash offers out there? Yeah, if you don't have the time to invest in watching this interview that I'm about to do with a local Seattle real estate pro, a guy who owns 11 properties, 13 doors, has his real estate license in two different states and has been doing this for over 10 years. If you don't even have enough time to sit back and watch 40 minutes of me interviewing somebody trying to help you help yourself, then you're going to continue to suffer from the same mediocrity that you've probably been suffering for and through your entire life. If you do, however, actually want to hear brilliant strategies and tactics that I had never heard of on how you can get your offer accepted, even if it's a weak offer, even if your financing is shaky, and even if you're afraid of losing to the infamous all cash buyer, then pay attention and watch this video. How's it going, guys? It's your boy Mike from Seattle. All around good guy, duly elected sheriff of the internet. Today I'm with Jim. Scott, who's with uh, Team Scott Homes. He is a real estate agent in the Seattle area, also a real estate investor. He's been doing it since 2009 when he bought his first duplex. In 2010, he got his real estate license. Also, for you local people around here, he worked at Boeing as a mechanic for 28 years before retiring just a few years ago and then moving into real estate full-time. He owns 11 properties, 13 different doors. He manages these properties himself. The reason that I've brought him on today to talk to anybody who wants to watch this is because me, with my infinite wisdom... That's a joke. Uh, it, I, I smash the Seattle real estate market all the time about how it's too overpriced, too expensive, it's ridiculous, and you shouldn't invest here. And Jim here is going to talk me down off the ledge and provide some much-needed perspective about this market. So I've spent uh, about an hour chatting with him, getting to know him. He's commented on a lot of my videos. I think he's a, a, an expert in the area and seems like a nice guy. Seems like it. Jim, go ahead and introduce yourself. I try to be a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it, Mike. I uh, Yeah, I'm very envious of you. Uh, I see that you're out there trying to make your way in life uh, earlier than I have done it. And uh, I'm very envious because if I was to go back and talk to myself 10, 12 years ago or even younger, in fact, than when I was in the 20s, uh, yeah, I would be doing what you're doing. I would uh, be buying my first duplex, renting out half, renting out a bedroom or two. Uh, and start building my rental portfolio one duplex at a time. Um, that's the that's the way to been doing it. I did it the hard way. <laughs> I bought my first duplex uh, back, like I said, back in '09. Uh, I had my real estate agent, and then I had one built, and then kind of got the bright idea of getting my license, uh, and then I got my third duplex, and then I kind of got the bright idea to get my wife to get her real estate license, and then we just went to the moon. Um, I just we did a couple flips, and then we just bought a portfolio of rentals during while everybody was selling. We were buying. I don't. I didn't feel like I was trying to catch a falling knife back in the day, but uh, ten years later, it kind of worked in my favor. Well, I mean, especially in a market like Seattle, which has just seen appreciation like very few other markets have you know a lot of homes that were being bought in 2009 2010 2011 my friends bought some back then have gone up hundreds of thousands of dollars in value so that's that's kind of why I'm I'm skeptical personally um, though I'm having you on to explain it because as values have continued to just skyrocket and even now we're seeing it with the coronavirus just prices just continue to go up at what point you know do we do we hit do we hit a price level that it just doesn't make sense anymore? So my my first question to you is, why do you like the Seattle and Greater Seattle area market? Like, what is it here that's working for you? So the beauty of our area is that we've got the mountains, we've got the lakes and the rivers, we've got the ocean. I mean, anything that you could possibly want is sitting right here, mm -hmm. or it's a short drive out. Right. Uh, you can go hiking, you go biking, you can go skiing, 
camping, I mean, you name it, you can do it. Um, and that's the beauty that everybody wants to be in the Seattle area. Uh, so, you know, it's funny because I swear every year when I'm out with clients, uh, buying clients, they're always, they have the same thought. It's, I mean, it's, I have this conversation, I, I, I kid you not, for probably the last five, seven years. Oh, I'm at the peak. We're at the peak. I, maybe we should hold off. Well, the ones that didn't hold off and did purchase, it, it's paid off. I keep thinking that personally that we do need to cap off and absorb the appreciation and just go sideways for a year or two and just kind of let things kind of consolidate. But um, much to my surprise, it just it continues to – to climb up and we just it's it's just crazy well it, it is crazy <laughs> that, that actually goes right i agree with my, you my next question is um so short term and long term for the market now i understand like you said this is a beautiful place to live like it's one of the best kept secrets when people think of seattle they think of twilight vampires and they think of a really rainy place but in reality <laughs> in reality it does rain here don't come it, 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 right so we would like to try to convince people it's raining and don't show up but in actuality it's 90 degrees outside right now it's a beautiful sunny day it's like a fifth Gorgeous. or sixth one in a row um, we have everything you could possibly want, sports teams, concerts, mountains, beaches, hiking, skiing, everything. So this is a desirable place to live, as well as tech industries like Boeing, Amazon, um, Starbucks, Microsoft. You know, so, I mean, this is, a, this is a popular spot, but the market is going crazy because it's so popular. What do you see happening in the short term versus long term? Do you see any difference or similarities there, short term being next three years, long term being next 10? So that is a very good question. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I got you. So a lot of folks don't know that uh, Redfin uh, is a great little resource. Uh, the redfin.com uh, backslash blog backslash data center. Are you familiar with this? I mean, I'm familiar with Redfin, but not the data center. So they, yeah, this is a, a very interesting little tool. So what I've got up here is a chart that I've uh, picked up for Washington, and then I entered, uh, we got Snohomish, Pierce, and Keene County. And um, I just did it for the, this uh, last year. And so the, to answer your question, so the red is the new listings in June um of 20, uh, last month okay. and then we've got the pierce county are the new listings and then uh snohomish county here is the new listings the kicker uh, to answer your question in regards to what i see for the short term the, the short answer is i don't know the <laughs> the uh and that's not the answer you're looking for because the reason i don't know is because the variable of the $600 weekly bump uh, getting kicked off and everybody going back to normal state unemployment uh, insurance and then Governor Inslee shutting and every, rolling stuff back and making it to where people are being literally, you know, sort of locked back into, um, into their homes. Um, we're we're kind of just, at the end of the day, it's all about supply and demand. Right. And so what we've got in our favor is the federal government. has got the, the central banks. have got the rates down to like 3%. I guess some people are getting under 3% on a 30 year fix now. Yeah. Mean, that's insane. Yeah. So if you're a home buyer, this is your moment in freaking time. The, what, the purchase power of that 3% versus the purchase power of 4% is, is like a 150 to $200 or more depending on the purchase price per month uh, of purchase power. Um, so in regards to the interest rate, this is it. Um, the the, the par bad part from a buyer's perspective is, is that we've got no supply. Uh, I did a search uh, last night and for the month of July, and I did it from 100,000 plus, so no end limit. Uh, in Snohomish County, there was only like 900 homes available in, in, in any price point right. in the entire county. Um, so our supply is like 
phenomenally low. We, yeah. we have no freaking inventory. So especially, I'd say, at the 600000 and below, pretty much expect a multiple offer. Unless, you, of course, you're out in Darrington or something like that. Right, you're right, right. Nowhere. But if you're, you're like in Everett, Marysville, Arlington, Lake Stevens, Snohomish, and, and it only gets worse when you go further south. Mm-hmm. Go in the Linwood Shoreline, Bellevue, Redmond, Seattle, uh, Federal Way. It's all multiple offer situation. Right. So right now we've got this imbalance of demand over supply. Now, going forward six months, I don't know what it's going to look like with our state if we're still in, in rolling things back and still uh, uh, keeping people unemployed, uh, living on unemployment insurance. That is going to have an impact. I just don't know what the folks that do this for a living and as economists I follow are all in the same boat is that we don't know what's going to happen with those folks that are on unemployment, the, the demand side. Now the supply part is probably going to maintain to be on the low part because sellers, this is our, our prime time. Summertime is the time to sell a home. And they're not out there, you know, okay, uh, honey, let's, you know, we need to either upsize, downsize. They're not into that mindset. They're hunkered down, uh, waiting this COVID thing out as well. And so we've got kind of a dense uh, amount of uh, listings inventory. So I, I honestly don't know what's going to happen in six months. There's so many variables and heaven only knows. Yeah, it's it's going to be touch and go here for a little while. That's that's for certain. Um, but I think what you said about the supply being an issue is 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 definitely uh, interesting because when I was looking at stats a couple of weeks ago, June of 2019, uh, there was an average of like 1,500 listings in Seattle. In June of 2020, it was 900 listings. Well, here here's a this is a year over year. So this is July of last year. Right? Uh huh. This red here is King County, right? And you can see what June uh, in King County is like here. Yeah. We had much more, even, I mean, you knew how difficult it was then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had and a supply problem then. <laughs> yeah. And it's even, I mean, it's it's insane. I mean, that's almost 50% less. Yeah. I yeah. The actual stats like 40-something percent less for Snohomish County. Right. Uh, and it's, it, so in the short term, there's going to be multiple offers. Uh, so that's a great thing to talk about, multiple offers. So actually, I have a friend of mine who's a police officer like me, not the duly elected sheriff of the internet, um, but he's just a normal officer. Anyways, he coincidentally was putting an offer on a house in Lake Stevens, and he put the wow. offer on the house, and it was uh, listed at four hundred and five thousand dollars, and he offered four twenty five. He didn't get it. There was ten other offers on the same property that's what he told me and he said he did not get it so my question to you and you told me that you have a, a, a pretty good system here how do you compete how do how do you stand a chance when you're one out of ten so I'll give you a little story to that I have a client we are uh, weak in our financing so when it comes to financing there's the conventional uh, loan where somebody can put 5, 10, 15, 20% down. There's the FHA, which is 3.5% down. Uh, there's VA, which is a zero down. And then there's uh, the Washington State Bond Program. Uh, it's a zero cost loan for first time home buyers uh, with FHA. And we were using the state bond program. So when I'm taking that offer and comparing it to somebody that's 10% uh, or 20% conventional, that other offer is stronger. Right. Okay. So I had weak financing. We had a very minimal uh, earnest money. And I, what I mean by minimal is the rule of thumb is you usually want to do 1% uh, to 2% earnest money. We are looking at a home for 350, so 3,500, 3, 4,000 for earnest money. Mm-hmm. I had $1,500 to work with. So our earnest money was fifteen hundred. Yikes! So it, it screams to you, "I'm a weak offer." Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so with those, I uh, submitted the offer with my strategies that we'll go over, 
and lo and behold, it had 10 offers total and I beat them. Well, I wonder if you were the same house that my buddy lost out to. <laughs> oh, that was in Marysville. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, um, so long story short, to answer your question, I will tell you, it matters who you use as a real estate agent. Okay. I, I'm not bad mouthing the folks out there. I'm sorry, but it's one of those deals that when you're going to a multiple offer situation, you don't want to be bringing a golden retriever. You want to be bringing a bulldog. Mm -hmm. It matters. And then the second, it matters who you use as a lender. Okay. Okay. So with those. So the first thing is there's a difference. So as a buyer, everybody's all well aware of the term pre-approval. Right. I got my letter and pre-approved. Do you know that there's another type that's called underwritten approved? No, I actually have not heard of an underwritten approved letter. A lot of people don't know about it because a lot of lenders don't do it. Mm -hmm. So what happens is uh, there's a lot of the banks, a lot of maybe federal, the, a lot of folks that do the VA, uh, they don't do them. So the uh, underwritten approval basically is taking the client's, uh, the buyer's file and has run it through underwriting. Mm -hmm less the house right okay and so now they give it the big old blessing that hey you're underwritten approved all you need is a house and an appraisal and you're done you're right. ready to go it's equivalent to a cash buyer okay that's good yeah so a we were underwritten approved you want to be underwritten approved have to be underwritten approved you need to ask your lender if you're looking at a home right now and you're out there uh, with a pre-approval letter you need to go back and talk to your lender. Can I get an underwritten approved letter? Find out if they do that or not. So the first thing I do is I follow up with the, with the listing agent. Hey, I, this is Jim Scott, Summit Properties Northwest. Just call on to see, uh, you guys got any offers on your home right now? And they go, oh yeah, I got five or six offers. So that what you want to do is kind of sit back and listen. Mm -hmm. uh, some agents on the listing side will not tell you nothing. Mm -hmm. Others kind of give you a little clues of where you are, um, and you can kind of poke on it. He's like, so if you're looking at a home at 400, um, so you got multiple offers over 400, huh? Yeah. Can you kind of we like five or six? You kind of poke on them in the direction. Mm -hmm. oh, I got eight currently. Uh, are you over four and a quarter? Um, not quite yet. A little bit. We're a little over. Oh, so you're not at 450 yet? No, we ain't there yet. So you're kind of trying to paint the picture where, where what we're trying to the box we're trying to fill right 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 so ask them if there's anything in particular that the sellers are looking for are, are they are they currently looking to move did they already find a place do mm -hmm. they need a rent back um do we be you know we're in a position where we could give you two weeks uh uh free rent if necessary um so you kind of find out what the seller's position is, what's important to the seller to where you can make those adjustments on your offer, okay? Right, right, right. So the third one is, and that's this is, this is critical, uh, the inspection. So generally speaking, if a home is listed and it's listed as uh, we're gonna look at offers, first come, first serve, mm -hmm. this may or may not work. But if they have a review date, like say today's uh, Monday, and we got a review date of Friday, mm -hmm. I want to uh, bring my inspector out and I want to do a pre-inspection. So okay. you want to call the listing agent and say, uh, hey, are we able to do a pre-inspection? So are you familiar that there's two different types of inspections? Nope, I just knew about one. <laughs> so there's the full meal deal. Right. And so the full meal deal is where the inspector's out there and he's running it through the meat grinder uh, and he's about there two and a half, three hours, and he's gonna give you a pretty detailed report with his write-up and all of the pictures, right? Mm. That's usually about $450, $500, depending on the inspector and the size of the building. The, there's another type called the walkie-talkie. Not a lot of inspectors do them. And it's half the price of a regular inspection. But he comes out and he'll does pretty much the same stuff, not nearly down to the, the finite details, but he goes over the roof, he goes over the, in the attic, goes in the crawl space, runs the, all of the systems, uh, looks for leaks, opens up the electrical panel, uh, really gives you, and you're there walking with them, 
going over the details of what he's finding. You're not going to get a write-up report. You're not going to get pretty pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's usually there maybe an hour, hour and a half tops. And it gives you a real good idea of, hey, whether you've got something here to worry about and we need to walk or go ahead and put your offer in and now you can waive the inspection. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. And it's, it's half the cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About 200 $250. So when you're doing it, I told my client, I was like, hey, when we're submitting our offer, we had the opportunity that was one of review date and I called and, hey, my, if we do a, a quick uh, pre-inspect, they said, yeah. So it's a $250 gamble. And I told them that. I said, this is going to put us in a good position, but at the end of the day, it could – Knowing, I didn't tell them, you know, our earnest money and our financing, our right, lead. right, right. Um, but you know, it is a gamble of two hundred and fifty bucks. So um, that's another. The if you cannot do a pre inspection, the one thing I would highly suggest is when you're filling out your your purchase and sell agreement is have your agent do a short inspection period. Um, I would do uh, the cookie cutter time allotment is 10 days. Mm -hmm. If I see a, a listing agreement that uh, or an offer on a, my listing that they want 10 days, that's the first thing I change. I, I squeeze it to five. And that's kind of the first stop. But if you're in a multiple offer situation, if you can make it one day, mm -hmm. that would be even ideal. <laughs> and then you want to add in an addendum uh, that basically says, but the buyer's inspection is informational for the buyer only. So okay. that you're giving the mindset to the seller, you know, I'm not going to come back and nickel and dime you for uh, items. Right, 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 right. Um, so if you get the opportunity to do a pre-inspect, that'll put you in a good position. If not, you want to shorten your inspection period and you want to reassure the, the seller that you're not going to nickel and dime them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, earnest money. I said earlier that it's usually one to 2%. If you really want to send a strong message to a seller, you want to increase it to like 5%. If you put down 10, 15, $20,000 on your earnest money, it sends a strong message right. to the listing agent and to the buyer or to the seller. Um, at the end of the day, that, that money is protected with your, uh, if you're doing the inspection or if you're doing your financing, you've got a, an inspection contingency, you've got your financing contingency, you've got your title report contingency, uh, you have your appraisal contingency. Your that money's pretty. I'm not gonna say it's bulletproof, protected, right. but it's pretty damn close. Right. Going into the number five, going into a multiple offer situation, we knew we had to put an escalation clause. We knew we weren't going to get it at that at that price point. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you familiar with an escalation? No, clause? no, I'm not. No, please explain it. So the escalation clause is just another addendum in the offer. Okay. And basically it says, your original offer says, uh, I'll give you $350,000 for your home. And then as you flip through my offer, there's an escalation clause that says, oh, by the way, uh, if you happen to get another offer that's like mine, very similar, I will beat that offer by X amount. I would encourage $1,500 increments. Generally seems to, uh, catch someone's attention. Mm -hmm. 500, 1,000, it doesn't, the 1,500 really kind of gets someone's attention to look your direction. Right, right, right. And so what happens is, is that, and then there's, a, there's another item down there that says, I'll do it, da 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 da, $1,500 increments up to this dollar amount. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a home for 350, so your buddy made an. You said your buddy made an uh, an offer. He was looking at four hundred. He made an offer of four and a quarter. Yeah, yeah, that's what you he was advised. An escalation clause. I'm sorry. What'd you say? You know, if he used ex escalation. Clause? I don't. I don't believe so. From what he told me, he said the house was listed at four hundred five. He had lost out on another house he had bid on. So this time his agent said, "Why don't we come in at four twenty five to show them we're serious?" Gotcha. And I think they just went straight for that four twenty five. Gotcha. So this is where it protects the buyer. So we did, rather than making our offer at 400, okay, mm -hmm. we knew that 400 was our max. And so the escalation clause says that, hey, we'll beat anybody that has a similar offer by 1,500 bucks up to 400,000. My buyer was about to shit bricks, but 
because he thought he was paying 350 or paying 400 for a $350,000 home. Right, right. And we had already seen other homes and we knew that 400 was what it was and mm. the house was worth 400 all day long. So anyways, the deal is, is that the other offer that's going to beat you has to be better than 400,000. Right. If somebody comes in and makes an offer of 401, you're out. Yep, yep. So my question then is, for somebody like me who's never dealt with this before, I'm assuming you have to get proof that they, in fact, actually had an offer that was, you know, you offered 350, someone offered 355. They have to prove someone else offered 355 for that to go into effect, right? That is correct. So that's part of the agreement is, is that uh, you, so in this example, uh, somebody went up to 385. So at 1500, 386, 500 is what we paid for it. Mm -hmm. And then part of the agreement is, is that um, you have to give me a copy of that purchase and sell agreement okay. so I can verify that you had a, 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 a comparable offer okay. that took my additional $36,500 okay. to justify the price. Right, right. That makes sense. And then you set your stop loss, which is the other key thing, which is <laughs> we're not going over a certain dollar amount. <laughs> Correct. But so keep this in mind. Um, I, from a listing side, I see this and all the time. So the first instinct is for you as the buyer is to, you're looking at 350,000, 400 your top. Mm -hmm. Your first instinct is to put your cap at 400,000, mm -hmm. right? Right, right. Well, there's a wise guy out there that's probably one of those other 10 offers uh -huh. that made theirs 400,500. Okay. Or 401,500. Right, right. They made it off just a little bit yep. because 90% of the, the agents are right at a 400. Mm -hmm. So you got beat out by 500 bucks or 1500 or whatever that little edge over right. the, the, the 100 is. So you want to make it a little bit above what, whether it stops at a 50 or it stops at a 100, whatever that right. stop cap is, make it a little bit more. Okay. And it just edges you out that much. That makes That's sense. What it takes. I mean, I've won literally. I've won with that 500 bucks. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a clever strategy. It's it's like it's like you know. I mean, it's essentially the reverse of you know you 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 buy, you buy something from a garage sale for 10 bucks and you sell it on eBay for like 13. You really just did that couple extra dollars of profit. But if you can if you can make it so that when somebody looks at your thing. You're gonna. I mean, because I'm sure the buyer is like, sure, I'll take an extra three hundred bucks, whatever, I'll, I'll take it, and that that's what it comes down to. So, right. Interesting. Yes and no. And so that brings me to my item number seven. Okay. This is the secret sauce. That's the secret sauce right there. Okay. Explain and what it. it is, is that you have the buyers write the sellers a love letter. Okay. I oddly enough. It doesn't work. I mean, all of these strategies put together, they'll that you've got about a 75, 80% chance of hitting it out of the ballpark. Sometimes you're you're just going to get struck out. Right. But the love letter, uh, more, a lot of buyers, or excuse me, a lot of sellers, it is about the dollar. Right. I want I want as much money as I can out of it. Right. 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 But the fun, the thing my experience has been is that there's also a good portion of sellers that are very emotional. Mm -hmm. They've been in this home for 20, 25, 30 years. They've raised their kids with it. They've updated the kitchen. I mean, they, it's not a house to them. It's right. a home. Right, right, right. So it means a lot to them to find the, the person that they hand it off to mm -hmm. is going to take it and, and run with it to, with the same love and the same attention that they did. Right, so right. So it's very emotional to them. So when a buyer writes a little love letter, oh, my name's you know, Jeff and my wife's name is Tina. I work at Boeing as a mechanic and Tina is a school teacher. And we first saw your home. Uh, we just knew instantly it was, it was going to be our home, the backyard, the kids are always wanted to have a backyard and a swing set. And now we can have a dog. You really, you know, right. Yeah. Through. Yeah. True. Pull on the heartstrings. <laughs> that's what you're doing. And you want to, and if you put a picture in it, that'd have been that much better. But um, yeah, you take that letter and you attach it, attach it to the offer mm -hmm. as, as part of the overall package. Mm -hmm. Because I've, I've done it where I've attached it as a separate file 
and some agents will send the offer, mm. but my letter doesn't make it. Right, right, right. If I attach that letter to the offer, I've got good assurance that letter is getting to the seller. That makes sense. Um, and then this particular example, I did that with this, with this, and the listing agent had even made mention that my my sellers have really got connect connected with your buyers mm. with, with their letter. Um, they were just really loved it. So you got your offer together, you tweaked it like I suggested, you put in your love letter, you send it. Number one mistake a lot of agents will do is sit back and hope that things will drop from the sky into the lap. Okay. The agent has got to follow up with the listing agent. Let them know that, hey, I submitted our offer. Um, I just want you to know that uh, we're pulling on the same end of the rope. If there's anything that we can do to uh, make this more of a smooth and timely transaction for your client. Um, we are here. We adore this house. But we want to make this home. Uh, uh, we want to win and just want to just because at the end of the day, believe it or not, uh, people will argue with me and I don't care, but it's true. The listing agent has an influence over the seller's decision mm. subconsciously or not subconsciously. Right. Uh, just the way you talk about this one versus the way you talk about it, it's, it's all subliminal. Right, but right, right. If I go in there and it, it, it's just the way it is. Mm. So you just really want to convince the seller, uh, the listing agent, that that's the offer. This right. is this is the one. Uh, because sometimes uh, the, the, that other offer, uh, and I've seen it where the other offer is higher, but they took the love they took the right. love letter offer. Right, they're interested they in the want, emotional aspect. Yeah, I've seen it more times than none. And then after I make my phone call, I have my lender call that listing agent mm -hmm. and assure them, hey, yeah, uh, Jeff and Tina are solid buyers. They're rock solid. I've got mm -hmm. everything I needed. I've done this program. Uh, I eat and breathe this, this particular loan program. Uh, we're going to, as soon as we get our purchase to sell agreement accepted, we're going to order up the, uh, uh, the appraisal. Um, we're, we're all about making this happen. I, I give you a, a weekly update every Friday, know where the loan is. Mm -hmm. um, you want them to know that, hey, these guys got their stuff together and it falls all but through the field goal post. Right. And actually, interesting, I hadn't thought about this because it's been so many, well, not so many years, but it's been two years since I bought my duplex. When I put the offer in on this place, my, my and I, I told my lender that I put the offer in on it. And he said, oh, fantastic. Give me the phone number. I'm going to call and, and chat with them and let them know. And I, I didn't even think of it as a strategy, but I'm sure this guy, who's much smarter than me, knew exactly what he was doing because it's business for him. I'm going to call. I'm going to lock this deal down for my guy. And Absolutely. sure enough, I managed to get it. And there were multiple offers on this place within 12 hours of it going on the market, which is... Yep. When, and I got it. So that's a that's a smart strategy. So really what I'm hearing is obviously experience matters. Your real yeah. estate agent matters. Yes. Uh, creative ways to be competitive in, include the uh, oh, the escalation clause. Um, the C, written approved. The, the pre the pre yeah the pre approval and then the pre underwriter approval. Right. That's a huge thing, which makes sense because and a lot of people don't know this, but yeah, you get pre approved from the bank, but then once they do it, they send it off to the underwriter who then asks for all these additional documents okay. and you can get hung up in that process. Right. right. Exactly. And so you're essentially telling them, no, 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 there is no hang up. And then cleverly using the inspection so that you can waive an inspection, which people are afraid of. Oh, what if something comes up in the inspection and it all falls? Hey, they waived the inspection because yes. you already did it for Correct. cheaper and made sure there's no major issues. Maybe Correct. you find, maybe something gets missed, but it would be something there's minor. You know? Yes, it's always knick knack petty whack right, stuff. Right. And I would never, ever, ever, well, I mean, I shouldn't say ever, but I never encourage a buyer uh, to waive an inspection. Just right. don't do it. Uh, funny story, I, an example, uh, I had a buyer uh, it was bought a home and it's 1996. The, we're flying through the inspection. Now, we were going to accept the house as is on the, on the inspection form. Mm -hmm. My inspector was up in the attic, last place to look. He comes down, and we were getting ready to accept the inspection as it was, ready to move forward. I said, hey, how's it, how did we do up there? 
He's oh, it looks pretty good for the most part. And I was like, oh boy, what's going <laughs> on? Uh, the most part was, and this is like a couple of years ago. So it's, it, it, the house is 1996. The the folks that had lived there before, uh, there was no insulation in the ceiling. Really, it was, it was new construction back in the 96. But the the builder is just slam bam. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> We forgot to put in some blow insulation in your attic. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah, that's a, that's a bit of an issue, you know, wintertime, yeah. summertime. Yeah. So you definitely want to have an inspection, whether you have the full meal deal right. or the walkie-talkie. And I would say the walkie-talkie, to be honest with you, um, was pretty damn comparable in regards to details right, right. of the inspection aspect as as the as the normal one. Um, so I would I would certainly. And it's half the cost. Mm. You just don't get the fancy printed printed out report. Is mm. all. Is all. Well, honestly, I think these are. I'm. I'm gonna hopefully get this passed along to my friend, who I don't know if he ever has gotten a house yet. I only had this conversation with him like maybe two weeks ago, uh, as he was getting denied because he was losing on multiple offers. But there's some interesting things you said that I've never heard of, never thought of, and are extremely valuable. Um, I guess. To close it out, I I, uh, I just want to hear your closing thoughts on, I don't know if we covered where you see our market going long term, like over 10 years, what you see happening, and then let people know where they can find you. And for those watching, uh, Jim here does have a YouTube channel. I'll put the link in the description below, but I'll let him. So thoughts on where the market here, Seattle, Snohomish, King, Pierce County are headed in the next 10 years, and then how people can contact you. So in the short term, a couple of years, I think we're going to, it's going to be interesting because um, with our current circumstances with COVID, uh, unemployment, Boeing being a big employer here, uh, airlines uh, not needing a lot of their planes, 777X mm -hmm. has gotten pushed out a year. Um, the 37, we can't seem to get that in the air. Uh, the demand for air, the, air travel is drastically lower. Yeah. So, you know, are we going to be, are we looking down the barrel of layoffs? I, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that's coming. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know if, you know, when these people get laid off, it's not like you, you can just go out and find another job. I right. mean, right. everything's in total freaking disarray that how are they going to replace that job? I mean, I, 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 I I run that scenario 10 ways mm -hmm. a Sunday to figure out what the answer is. And my head just s spins. Right. Right. So I don't know. Um, as we get into the, you know, five, 10 years, I think it's going to continue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so as our economy, you know, we get the COVID thing taken care of eventually. Um, but we're always going to have jobs. Everybody's always going to love the Northwest. And uh, the, the demand is always going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be interesting because of the demographics of, uh, I was telling you earlier, with uh, a gigantic uh, wave of folks are walking into retirement. Mm -hmm. And I envision that a lot of folks are up to here with their taxes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ready to cash out. And I mean, I've seen it with yeah. uh, my sphere of Boeing folks uh, have left. Uh, some have gone to Idaho, some have gone to Montana, some have gone to Arizona. Um, hence, I've got my license for Arizona now. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this folks, uh, I, the supply should be interesting because I'm thinking the supply and demand will kind of even out. And I think, you know, we should slow down a little bit with the appreciation factor um, and just have a, a nice low uh, single digit appreciation factor and, and be back to some sort of normalcy would be ideal in <laughs> right. five, 10 years. A little bit of sanity, hopefully. Yeah. Well, okay, uh, Jim, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, if uh, for any buyers or sellers, I extend out an invite, uh, feel free to contact me if you'd like further consultation. Um, for sellers, it's a crazy market out there. I would encourage uh, sellers to interview at least three real estate agents and review their marketing plan, their communication plan, uh, their experience. Um, 
And then for buyers, it's just as equally crazy, and it does matter who you use. Right. If you're uh, looking for further consultation to be successful, feel free to call us, uh, Jim and Denise Scott. My number is 425-903-2429. My email is teamscott at teamscotthomes.com, and you see our website at teamscotthomes.com. Perfect, Jim, and I'll put your contact info in the description down below. Thank you for coming on, and I appreciate all the information, and hopefully you guys go check out his YouTube channel, show him a little bit of love, and ask him questions because he actually responds oh, with, length, with lengthy responses too. Yes, I do. All right, Jim, we'll talk to you later. I appreciate your time, Mike. Thank you. No problem.